Hi, I'm Jay Nordlinger with the Human Parade. We're in New York, New York City, with a New Yorker if there ever was one, Mayor Ed Koch. He's not been mayor in some time, since 1989, but it's still perfectly natural to call him Mayor. It's like he was born with that name. You weren't born named Mayor, were you? No. <laughs> he was born Edward I. Koch, Edward Irving Koch, in the Bronx. He served in World War II, going to France. He was elected to Congress in 1968, spending four and a half terms there. Why the half? In 1977, he was elected mayor of New York. He served in that role for three terms. In his post-mayoral years, because it's been over 20 years now, he's been a whirlwind of activity, writing book after book, penning column after column, doing radio show after television show after everything else. He was a judge on the People's Court. He's a regular movie reviewer. He corresponds with people in and out of public life all over the world and often publishes that correspondence. Many years ago, in the early 1980s, I believe, Robert Novak, the late journalist, called Koch one of the most interesting politicians in America. I agree. Thank you. You were uh, born in the Bronx, but did you grow up in New Jersey? Uh, for 10 years. We uh, left the Bronx when I was seven years old in 1931 during the uh, Depression. My father didn't have a job and he got a uh, job in uh, Newark and I was there, went to high school in Newark, uh, and then uh, escaped when I was uh, 17 or so, and back in 1941 we moved to Brooklyn. Tough neighborhood or a tranquil neighborhood? Oh, very tranquil, very tranquil. What did your dad do, and how did you weather the depression? Well, my father, I loved my father, I loved my mother, uh, both deceased, obviously. Uh, my father, Always, uh, he died at 87, he always had two jobs. He was such a hard uh, worker, such a sweet uh, man. Everybody loved him. Uh, and he was basically a fur manufacturer uh, making fur coats. And of course, during the Depression, people didn't buy fur coats. Mm -hmm. So uh, my uncle, my mother's brother, gave him a hat check concession in uh, a dance hall that he had and he checked hats and coats, and I checked them along with my mother and my father. It was a tough life. And then, as I say, in about 1941, we moved to uh, Brooklyn, and he went back into the fur business. Did you see grim scenes during the Depression? Did you see bread lines? Did you see bums? Did you see people speak? I, actually not. Uh, I mean, we were very poor, but we didn't know we were poor, at least a child. Mm. my age, because uh, everybody was poor. D did you have childhood aspirations? Did you, did you want to be in politics? Did you want to be in showbiz? No, no. Uh, um, baseball uh, player? Well, uh, you know, a Jewish kid is either a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> and I decided I'd be a lawyer. Yeah. And uh, did you go to law school here in New York? I went to uh, New York uh, University School of Law. Yeah. After the war? After the war, what was interesting, I was very lucky because I served uh, in the Army for, drafted for uh, three years. And when I uh, came back, I only had two years of uh, CCNY, but I applied directly to NYU Law, and they took me. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, and I was also in the last accelerated class, so you did uh, three years of law in two years, I came out. Uh, the same age that I would have been had I not been drafted. Ah, that worked out neatly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what did you see in the war? I was uh, in uh, France and Germany, and uh, I was in the combat infantry, uh, the 104th Infantry Division, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a very important part of my life. Yeah. Um, do you remember, what in particular do you remember uh, that left a, a well, particular impression. You didn't go into liberated camps, No, did you? I did not, mm -hmm. no. Uh, one of my close friends uh, at the time, uh, Michael Berrigan, who now lives in Pennsylvania, uh, we were both running across a field uh, in Holland that had mines, and he stepped on a, uh, on a mine, and mm -hmm. his foot blew off. Mm -hmm. And I crawled over uh, along with another guy, uh, to comfort him until the uh, uh, meds came and 
uh, took him away. And but he's uh, uh, doing uh, okay. We haven't corresponded for a very, very long time, but he has family. And his son came to City Hall uh, when I was mayor. Uh, regrettably, I wasn't uh, there at the time. I was out to lunch uh, to thank me for helping his dad. Uh, I did very little, uh, but anyway, that's the most memorable. Nice. And uh, you, you begin in politics, well, you begin holding office in the mid-1960s in the well, New York City I, Council. Well, I moved to Greenwich Village in 1956, and I joined uh, the effort to elect Adlai Stevenson, who nobody mm -hmm. remembers, I'm sure. Madly for Adlai, people said. <laughs> right. I'm madly for Adlai. Right, he had the hole in his shoe, yeah. people will remember that. And uh, out of that came the Village Independent Democrats. I became their street speaker. Uh, we ran against uh, DeSapio, uh, the candidate uh, that we were supporting, won, uh, but then uh, uh, two years later decided not to run for re-election. They needed a candidate. I said, I'll do it. Nobody wanted to do it. And uh, I was elected, and I was elected, that would be in, in uh, 1963, I was elected uh, uh, with a 41 vote uh, majority. And so there was a re-election ordered by uh, the court. And uh, I won again uh, with over, I think it was a 400 majority. Uh, and then the regular election came and I won again and Carmine disappeared. Uh, I should say before that I ran for the first time uh, in 1962 for the assembly and I lost. Uh, and I should have lost because I didn't know enough. Mm. And in a way, if I had won, I'd still be in Albany, and that would be a fate worse than death. <laughs> <laughs> You're not running for governor anymore, so you can say no. that. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, you elected to the city council in 66? In 66, uh, uh, there was an open seat, and it was a Republican seat. It had been Republican for 38 years, and I won it. It was a big uh, upset. How, how did it feel to win? I mean, the first time, particularly. Was it well, a feeling it, of elation? It's exhilarating. Uh, I would to, think. It's exhilarating. The best part of that one with respect to Carmine was that at a quarter to 10, uh, the polls closed then at 10, I looked around at the clubhouse and everybody's there. And I said, get out, go bring in the people. There are still people who haven't voted. And I ran out. They gave me a card of somebody who hadn't voted. And I ran across the street. Uh, she lived in the building uh, directly across from my residence. And I uh, called her up, and whatever her name was, Mrs. Singer. Um, uh, this is Ed Koch. Uh, you haven't voted. Please come down and vote. She said, I'm in my nightgown. <laughs> and uh, I said, it's so important. She said, my vote doesn't count. I said, Mrs. Singer, I'm the candidate. If your vote didn't count, would I be here in the rain begging you to come down? And she said, I'll be right down. She came down in her nightgown with a raincoat. This is a story that appeared in the New York Times the next day. And uh, she came, went to the polls. And with, since we only won by 41 votes, she is certain she's the vote that elected me. Right. <laughs> and uh, you run for the House in uh, 68. That was a very exciting election, 1968. Uh, I supported uh, uh, Bobby Kennedy. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, I, I was a, a candidate for a, a seat that had been Republican for 31 years, <laughs> so nobody thought I could win that one. Uh, Whitney North Seymour Jr. was the Republican, an outstanding guy. Uh, his father was the head of the American Bar Association. I used to sum it up by saying, I know everybody thinks a guy with two names can't beat a guy with four names. <laughs> But I did. You played a class card. <laughs> Very tricky. That's a hell of a moniker he had. Uh, a, Whitney North Seymour Jr. Mike was uh, his nickname. Straight from Choate or something. <laughs> <laughs> were you, um, when you ran for the House, were you thinking springboard to the mayoralty, springboard no. to the, you were just thinking no. House? I, I never had aspirations to run for mayor until uh, in 73 uh, when the fiscal crisis came. Uh, and we were told that the banks were not going to lend any more money uh, to uh, the city of New York. Lindsay uh, uh, was mayor. Uh, and I thought, well, I know a lot that these guys who are running don't know. And um, we raised $100,000, and I decided I would run. In sure. Was two, that a lot, mayor? In those days, no. Not even not in those even days. Then? It was very uh -huh. modest. 
<laughs> and, and two weeks later, I was uh, out of the race. We didn't have any money. It had all been spent. Uh, and uh, I went, I served in Congress. And then when uh, Beam was elected, um, in a way, it was fortunate for me because I would have been blamed as he was blamed for the full force of the uh, crisis that uh, hit New York. And uh, so uh, when uh, four years uh, later, uh, in 77, uh, there was another election and I decided to run again, I won. And it was a very uh, historic panel that was running, uh, Mario Cuomo, uh, Herman Badillo, Bella Absug, uh, 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 Percy Sutton. Uh, it was an outstanding uh, group of people, and I won. Was Bella a, an honest to goodness Stalinist? Well, Had I don't really been? know. But I think so. Hmm. <laughs> I don't really know. She didn't like you much, did she? She hated me. I mean, I would sum it up by saying this: that when um, uh, I was uh, running for Congress, uh, Bella, uh, who was a very impressive person, and with great uh, intellect and energy. And she formed something called the um, 17th Congressional uh, Committee to interview candidates. And she said to me, uh, would you agree uh, to uh, come out against NATO? Come out against NATO? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes. I said, only when the Warsaw Convention ends then we can talk about it. So that would be the difference between me. I have summed up my political life many, many times uh, going back to Congress uh, uh, that I'm a liberal with sanity. Did you enjoy yourself in the House? Uh, were I loved you, were, it. I loved you, it. You don't seem to be the legislative type, more an executive type. Both. I must mm. say um, I enjoyed uh, uh, coming up with legislation and working uh, with others and at that particular moment. Uh, the major issue was the Vietnam War, uh, and uh, I was opposed to it, as was Bella and all of uh, the uh, liberals. I went to Canada and uh, interviewed American young men who uh, were draft resistors and had fled to Canada, and also those who had deserted the armed forces and were in Canada. Uh, and I came back and I said, we should give them amnesty. Bring them back. And I was running for office uh, for re-election and people, uh, as a congressman, and people said, oh, you're going to lose. And I said, I don't think so. And my father, who was helping me at the time, he was asked by a reporter, what do you think about your uh, son urging amnesty for uh, deserters? And my father said, everybody's entitled to make a mistake. Did you, you oppose the war from the beginning? Yes. Always anti-Vietnam? Yeah. Did you ever have second thoughts? later? On Vietnam? Yeah. No. Well, when, I, when, I, when, when, when Reagan is a candidate, I think in yeah. 1976, he caused a big stir when he said that Vietnam, Vietnam was a noble cause. And we see this all the more with what the communists did to the United Peninsula, with what the Khmer Rouge did in Cambodia. And well, so on. let me put it this way and bring it up uh, to date. I'm for getting out of Afghanistan and Iraq. I was for going in. I remember. Because uh, the CIA, uh, uh, with respect to Iraq, said that uh, they uh, uh, had the nuclear bomb and uh, biological uh, warfare was uh, in the minds of Saddam Hussein, etc. And uh, so I was for going in. Yeah. But when we found out uh, that they didn't have it. We should have started getting out. Instead, we have been there for eight years. I was for in going, going into Afghanistan. We've been there now for 10 years. They hate us. I, I'm amazed uh, that there isn't an outrage in America, and, but I know what it is. It is that we no longer have the draft, and therefore it's somebody else's war. If this war were based on an American draft for the armed forces, the mothers and fathers would be in the streets as they were in the time of uh, Vietnam. Now, President Obama, he now uh, is responsible uh, for four wars. Uh, while uh, Iraq was not his, um, uh, Afghanistan became his when he put in 30,000 additional troops, and uh, Libya is his. Uh, and Yemen is his. It's impossible. And then you have a situation uh, where the NATO forces, of which you were a part, 
I didn't know until a few days ago when I read it in one of the newspapers, we're paying 75% of the costs of NATO and our allies have deserted us in uh, Afghanistan uh, and Iraq. Uh, some of them are still there, but they're, as somebody said, running for the exits mm -hmm. and have been for a long time. Let me tussle with you one, one more time on, on Vietnam. Yeah. Um, you disagree with the idea that this was, if, 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 um, if a misguided cause, something America shouldn't have been in, you disagree that it was a noble cause? Well, I think that there was a certain nobility in terms of uh, some of the people who were for it. But my basic position then uh, was uh, that we uh, should not be supporting corrupt people. And the uh, South Vietnamese regime was corrupt. The North Vietnamese regime uh, was communist. They deserved one another. They didn't deserve our blood. They didn't deserve our treasure. The regime in the South wasn't genocidal, like it the communist regime It was corrupt. Sure. Corrupt. And I don't believe that American blood should be spilled for a corrupt re regime. The same way Afghanistan. Corrupt. Those people have become millionaires on American monies that are being sent there. I want to go back to the mayoralty. Yeah. So you're elected in 77. Yeah. A big deal. Right. And um, I think you're at Coney Island, and a little old lady comes up to you on the boardwalk. Tell me about that. Well, I went down there with uh, one of my close uh, friends, Dan Wolf, who was the editor of the Village Voice uh, uh, in the earlier years, and he became an advisor without pay. Um, and helped me at City Hall, a very wise man. And we're walking on the boardwalk, and an elderly lady, I always say elderly, she was 70, I'm 87, <laughs> <laughs> came running towards me, uh, and she as, grabbed as my she hand. Could. She grabbed my hand, and she said, Mayor, make it like it was. And I thought to myself, it never was the way you think it was, but I'm going to try to make it better. It was a very memorable uh, moment for me. You're, um, you're such a New Yorker, and uh, you seem to revel in the mayoralty. You just I relished did. it. You were, I, I, I don't did. think anyone's ever been happier in a job than you, you were as mayor in New York. You are absolutely right. But in, in 1982, you decided you'd run for governor. Stupid. And I did it. It's interesting why I did it. I had just been on a uh, vacation in Spain. I come back. And uh, Rupert Murdoch, who I'm very indebted to uh, because without him I could not have been elected mayor in the first instance. Uh, it was the support of the New York Post that I think made the huge difference because I was unknown and we didn't have much money. Um, but he ran while I was out of the country, coupon saying, urge Koch to run for governor. So I get off the plane and the reporters are all there. Are you going to run for governor? It was hubris on my part. Firstly, I didn't want to be governor. I mean, You didn't I, think of it as a higher rung? Uh, no. Next step? I, I mean, it was, um, um, six months before I'd been interviewed by Playboy, the reporter said, what do you think of all these people who are going uh, upstate in the rural areas? I said, are you crazy? It's sterile. Mm. Uh, Albany's a fate worse than death. Uh, that was before your candidacy. <laughs> yeah, before my yeah. candidacy. So then when I uh, ran, uh, I was 40 points ahead when I announced. And when the Playboy interview came out shortly thereafter, I was 40 points behind. Uh, and I was, but it, it, I would have been so unhappy if I had, uh, when I remember uh, going up uh, to Albany and being in an elevator in one of the hotels, and a young woman said uh, to me, Mayor, uh, you shouldn't have said what you said about Albany. I said, what do you have in mind? She said, when you said Albany is a fate worse than death, I said, isn't it? <laughs> and she said, it is, Mayor, but you shouldn't have said it. <laughs> did, did I read recently that, that you've repaired relations with Mario Cuomo? Oh, yes. We are good friends. Uh, Mario, he said, only in New York uh, would you have a mayor who wanted to be governor and a governor who wanted to be mayor. <laughs> it's a little overstated, but it's okay. It's, and in, in any event, I did have uh, uh, ill will uh, in the course of the elections. Um, and it's like a civil war. 
it's, uh, it's, it's incredible. I mean, it really is worse than any other, a primary it is worse than a general election in terms of bitterness. So in any event, I decided uh, some time ago uh, in my 80s, uh, as I said, I'm 87, in my 87th year, um, I said, what do I want to uh, be burdened with grudges? It's crazy. It uses up energy. Yeah. And so I said, rightly or wrongly, if I have held these grudges, they're over. And they are. So you, you released the one about Cuomo plus others? Oh, sure. Huh. Good for yeah. you. Why do you think that uh, Cuomo never ran for president? It's a mystery, and uh, you know, uh, they sum it up by saying Hamlet on the Hudson. Yeah. That he could never make it. He was a... such a hot ticket in 1984, and oh, I forget he's 1988. A brilliant speaker. I mean, um, it was amazing that I won in 77, because I'm not a brilliant speaker. I'm a good speaker, but not brilliant. He is brilliant. And nevertheless, uh, I won. And I will tell you why I uh, think I won. People believed me. Mm. And uh, I remember Murray Kempton called me up and he said, uh, you can't win. I said, Murray, would you come out with me in my uh, campaign truck? And he Good. came out and we went to- Just Brooklyn. for the sake of our audience, famous journalist with Newsday, oh, yeah. I think. Yeah, okay. yeah. And he, uh, we went out and, and I, to a parking lot, uh, uh, a major uh, food store, uh, Wallbaums. And a young woman, it was early in the morning, like 7.30, and the young woman comes by and uh, she looks at me and she says, why do I believe you? <laughs> and then she says, and she repeats my campaign slogan, which was, uh, after eight years of charisma, reference to Lindsay, mm -hmm. and four years of the clubhouse, why not try competence? Mm -hmm. Nobody repeats long slogans like that. that is and a then wordy. she says, yeah. my husband said to me, what do you got, the hots for him? <laughs> so I said, are you gonna vote for me? She said, of course I am. And I said, what's your name? Phyllis Vigilante. So I said to Murray subsequently, if Phyllis Vigilante is voting for me, I've won. Your, um, here's a disagreement you have with Cuomo. Am I correct that you are in favor of capital punishment? I still am. And so uh, is about 60%. It used to be probably 80%. I believe it should be used sparingly, but I believe that there are certain horrendous crimes, like the one in Connecticut where two guys came in and uh, raped two daughters yeah, yeah. and the mother and killed uh, the daughters and the mother. I mean, it was awful. Uh, I believe that there are cases uh, where capital punishment is justified. I, I understand those who are opposed to it. Um, you've always been very strongly pro-choice on abortion, I think. Yes, of course. Have you ever had any doubts? Any well, doubts? Uh, well, let me just say why I'm very uh, strong on that. My mother had a, uh, several abortions because, uh, and she told us about it. She told my uh, sister and me and my older brother at the time. Uh, and she almost died, she said, because she had to go to some street guy, wasn't a doctor, so I am saying uh, that, well, I, uh, nobody likes the idea of an abortion. Uh, but, and, and if I uh, felt that the, the opponents would agree and stop trying to eliminate all abortions, because there are huge numbers of people who are opposed to abortion, uh, uh, even when it includes the life of the mother or rape or incest, they say no. I would uh, limit abortion if they would agree to accept it, which they never will, so it'll never come up, uh, and limit it uh, uh, to uh, the uh, life of uh, the mother, um, gross uh, defect in the uh, fetus, uh, rape, uh, incest. I would not, uh, if they agreed, but they won't, uh, uh, allow it just for economic interests. You don't want the baby. And it also you have to, at the same time, uh, provide an opportunity for the adoption of that uh, baby. Nobody should be forced uh, to uh, carry a child and to raise a child if they just don't want it. Mayor, I'm, I'm jumping around with you because there, there's so much to discuss, so a little more jumping. I think I remember something uh, correctly from your mayoralty. You'll, you'll correct me if I, if I do not. 
But I think you said, and it was controversial at the time, and I think it's pretty much accepted now, you said, look, there's no link between poverty and crime. Being poor doesn't make you criminal. I said that. And, and the, 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 the belief, the, almost the uh, credo that I grew up with was that, that crime stems from poverty. I don't think so. It's BS, yeah. isn't it? It is. Uh, the fact is uh, that we had lowest crime rates uh, during uh, the Depression. Uh, and uh, crime rates uh, during the recent recession uh, didn't uh, spike and mm. uh, go up. I do not believe that uh, poverty uh, causes um, uh, crimes uh, to escalate. Uh, I believe uh, that not punishing crimes or criminals will cause others to engage in a crime. Why have we had uh, far less crime over the last uh, 10 or 15 uh, years, which is a fact. New York is one of the safest cities in America today. It was not when I was uh, mayor. It, I believe the, one of the major reasons is mandatory prison terms because the same people commit crimes over and over yeah. again. And if they're in prison, they're not committing them. Mm. Um, and of course, there's always the movement, oh, why do you put them in prison? It costs more uh, to be in prison than to send them to Harvard. You've yeah, heard that? A million it's times. It's baloney. Yeah. I mean, you gotta, uh, for me, society's rights are paramount. Mm. I believe uh, that the best way to deal with crime and depress it uh, is to make it clear to those who commit it, they're gonna be punished and heavy punishment. Isn't it strange, Mayor, I, I've thought about this a couple of times, let's see, it's, it's 2011, and I think we'll have gone 20 years in New York City without a Democratic mayor. That can't keep up, can it? Uh, the next mayor will be Democratic, yeah. there's no question about it. Uh, we were lucky to have uh, Bloomberg, in my judgment, uh, but he was only able to make it uh, because of his enormous financial resources as a Republican. And, and he's not, really a Democrat, but he knew he could not win in a Democratic primary. Don't you think that 9-11 plays a role in his election? Oh, sure. But um, I would say mostly, um, uh, and I don't even remember who he was running against. Oh, Mark Green would be yeah, right, one of right, them. Right. Uh, he was I, a Democratic nominee. Yeah. He was terrible. <laughs> I, I, you old, know, I, old, old aide to uh, Ramsey Clark. I believe. Right. I mean, yeah. aside from all of that. In fact, as he's gone, I, don't need, I haven't heard from him in years. A favorite uh, of Bill Buckley, Mark was. Uh, he, Bill Buckley liked him. Yeah. yeah. Why? I don't know. <laughs> because Green was a good verbalist. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I mean, I don't want to be too, too tough on uh, Mark. He almost became uh, mayor, uh, and I supported Bloomberg, and and Bloomberg uh, beat him. Mayor, when you, uh, you lost to David Dinkins in the 1989 yeah. Democratic primary, did it take a while to bounce back from that? I mean, was it... Was well, it I'll tell you what happened. Um, uh, I lost uh, because uh, about six weeks before the uh, election, uh, a young uh, black uh, uh, male uh, was murdered in a racist murder, mm. uh, and uh, that uh, caused uh, the... Uh, black community in Brooklyn and in Harlem to coalesce in a much greater degree than ever before. And of course the uh, issue uh, of, you get tired of somebody. I mean, sooner or later Hard you, they to get going. tired. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, what I said uh, uh, to them very often, I'm mean, probably very cheeky, I would say to them, listen, if, if you wanted to all get together, those who I've offended, you could throw me out if you do. I'll get a better job and you won't get a better mayor. <laughs> and I've used that. You, um, you were very hard on Giuliani for a while. I think you wrote yeah. a book about him called Nasty Man. Giuliani, Nasty Man. Yeah. Are you better with him now? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I voted for him twice. Every time he ran, which was for mayor, I voted for him. Mm. And uh, we've never had a bad relationship because my criticism of him, uh, which was, uh, uh, stated in my columns that I wrote at the time, because that was basically the book that I put together, related to his personality. Mm. He's a very tough man. So that, for example, uh, the two top black officials at the time, Carl McCall, who was a state controller, 
and Virginia Field, who was the borough president of Manhattan, uh, both uh, asked uh, to meet with him, and he wouldn't meet with them. And it went on for over a year, and uh, uh, they were complaining. And uh, I said to Carl, do you mind if I ask him why? No, ask him. So I said, Rudy, why won't you meet with uh, Carl and Virginia? And he said, I don't agree with them. I said, Rudy, you only meet with people you agree with? That's crazy. Mm. So it was his personality, but he was a very good mayor. I, I blame you for something, Ed Koch. I'll tell you what I blame you for. You were the one responsible for the mainstreaming of Al Sharpton. You made him all I did. cute and cuddly. I did. This race baiter, this no, insider I don't think he's a of race hatred. Let me tell you my... You went uh, on a cooking show with him and made him all sweet and let all me Let me tell you about Al Sharpton. You did this. Um, in the first year of my uh, mayoralty, he came down and uh, insisted that I uh, sign a petition uh, which would give all federal summer jobs only uh, to minority people. And I said, no, there are poor whites who would be eligible. Yeah. Well, if you uh, don't sign this petition, uh, we're going to sit down in front of your office and not let anybody in. He brought down about 25 black ministers. I said, you can't do that. You can uh, pick it on the steps outside. He said, no, we're going to do it. And they sat down for them. And uh, I, I said to the cop, they had a cop <laughs> in that area. I said to them, remove him. Uh, he says, and he whispers to me, what if they resist? I said, have <laughs> you never you heard the word arrest? <laughs> arrest them! Okay, now Al Sharpton, every time we appeared together uh, subsequently, would tell that story. And he said, he had me arrested and he made me famous. Mm. But he never stopped talking to me. Yeah. And we did talk. And I think that there was a change in his position. The only thing that he hasn't done that I advised him to do to change his position so he could become a crossover leader, uh, I said to him, you have to admit uh, that uh, Tawana Brawley, you remember that yeah. case, was a hoax. Mm. And he never did. Mm. And he never will. Why? I don't know. I'm going to read a, a great tribute to you by this hero, Sharpton. Um, at the end of the day, he, you, had respect for African Americans and Latinos. He respects us enough not to placate us. We probably would have liked it better if he told us what we wanted to hear, but he respected us enough to talk to us like adults and tell us what he was and wasn't going to do. Very nice. It is, is nice. Is it your impression, as it is mine, uh, that the terrible poison of race in American life has abated? Uh, in the city of New York, there is little or no racial friction, and I uh, give uh, Mayor Bloomberg full credit uh, for that. Uh, uh, and I think, frankly, it's because of his, I hope he doesn't take this uh, badly, his uh, bland personality. Uh, and he's not a bland person uh, in conversation. Yeah. He's a very exciting person. But in public, uh, it's sort of a bland... Not a lot of color. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't excite people. And I think uh, exciting people, as I did, as Giuliani did, uh, can cause uh, far greater tension. Um, and uh, so at this moment, and I think throughout America it is uh, true, is, well, we have a black president. Mm. And everybody uh, gloried in that, uh, even those who didn't vote for him, saying, see, that's what America is all about, mm -hmm. opportunity. Let's talk presidents. In, in 1980, you were mayor of New York and you endorsed the Republican nominee, Reagan. Yeah. Tell no, me, I, no tell I didn't endorse uh, uh, Reagan, no. The only Republican that I endorsed was Bush. I did not endorse Reagan. I loved him, but I did not endorse him. Oh, I misremembered that. Um, here's a, a story I have in my mind. You tell me where I have it wrong. Yeah. Do you have lunch with Cy Vance? The, I did. The, the, I the did. then former Secretary of State. Yes. And does he tell you something like Carter's going to screw Israel in he second He certainly term? did. And uh, I was then called uh, by, uh, I can't remember his name, Great Times. Bill Sapphire. Bill Sapphire, a columnist. And he uh, said, cast your mind back. Uh, did this happen? Uh, and he gives that issue uh, where Cy Vance had been at a lunch. And when I asked the question, 
had uh, shaken his head affirmatively, uh, whether he, uh, Carter would sell out the Jews in Israel mm -hmm. and so forth. And uh, he, uh, he said, I just, uh, this was a few weeks before the election, and he said, I want to just confirm it. Uh, so I thought to myself, I could destroy Carter. Uh, it's not right. And I also, it's not right to do this to Cy Vance. Uh, so I said to him, no. That was a lie. Mm. And I subsequently uh, said that it was uh, mm. a lie to... Corrected think, the record. I think Sapphire forgave me. I mean, I did not want uh, to be the reason for the, uh, the national election to be decided based on that one uh, incident. And then I called up uh, Cy Vance uh, uh, thinking, well, uh, maybe he doesn't mind. And he, he said, oh, you can't say that! You can't. <laughs> you, you know. So I didn't. I mean, I didn't. Come 1984, yeah. do you endorse the Democratic nominee Mondale over Reagan? Yeah, I did. You trusted Mondale on foreign policy? I liked uh, Fritz Mondale. We worked uh, very closely together. He was a very decent man. He was not Carter. He was a very decent man. Now, now the secret ballot is a sacred thing. Did you vote for Mondale over Reagan? Honest to God, I did. Huh. Um, but you admire Reagan. Say it again. You admire Reagan? I loved Reagan. And I never voted for him. Uh, he was just such a decent man. Can I give you a little uh, anecdote? I was going to ask for it. Okay. I hope it's the one I'm thinking of. Well, uh, Coming back from the airport? I don't know about that Riding one, back from the airport, the crowds around him. Someone gives him the finger. Oh, yeah, 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 I'll tell that good, one. Good, okay. That's what right. I like. I, uh, I met um, uh, Reagan, as I did every president, at the helicopter port uh, to bring him to wherever they were going when they came to the city. And uh, I pick up uh, President Reagan uh, on the west side, and uh, we are crossing 42nd Street. Uh, and everybody knew he was in town. It was no secret. And they're out there by the thousands, and they're cheering him. And I'm in his um, limousine. And um, he's looking out the window and he says, Ah, oh, look at that guy, look at that guy. He's giving me the finger. I said, Let me see, Mr. President. There's a guy and he's giving him the finger. So <laughs> I said, Mr. President, why, why are you so upset? There are tens of thousands of people and they're cheering you. One guy gives you the finger. He says, that's what Nancy always says. I always see the guy with the finger. <laughs> you, you remind me of a, of a George W. Bush story. He's in uh, Washington State, I believe, campaigning with a congressman. And this made the news because a school bus went by. And the school bus driver gave President Bush the finger. And later, the congressman said what Bush had said, that Bush turned to the congressman and said, not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> Jump way ahead to 2000. You go for Gore over Bush. Yeah. 2004, Bush versus Kerry. Yeah. You go for Bush. Right. You didn't trust Kerry with the war on terror and with absolutely. Policy. I did not believe uh, that uh, Kerry or the Democratic Party understood uh, uh, that there was an Islamic. Uh, uh, war against the United States of terrorism, uh, and I did not think they uh, would respond adequately, and I was convinced that uh, Bush would. And I said this, and I said, I don't agree with uh, President Bush on a single domestic issue. They called me up, uh, some of his people, not he, mm. and said, w would you endorse him? And uh, I said, you understand, I don't agree with him on a single domestic issue. And they said, you can say that. And I said, sure. And then I um, campaigned for him, particularly in Florida uh, with uh, the Jewish communities, which were very large in Florida, uh, was a very important uh, state. And uh, the Republican forces and, and President Bush uh, thought that I uh, helped. I must say, you know, uh, Jews, nuts. <laughs> I'm, I'm Jewish. <laughs> you are? <laughs> <laughs> and, but they vote against their own self-interest. I mean, when I, uh, they always think that FDR is on the ballot. <laughs> Look, I wanted to get to 2012 later, but since you brought it up, a lot of people are saying, you know, Obama's going to have a tough time with Jewish Democrats in the 2012 election. I'm not sure. Uh, I say, 
the guy could bomb Tel Aviv or <laughs> mandate the <laughs> eating of pork and American Jews would vote for him in overwhelming numbers. It's now, let me tell you, it's, I'll, let me it's explain. a religion. I'm going to explain why. Liberalism is a religion. I'm going to explain why. It's to their credit and to their discredit. You know, Rabbi Hillel, uh, several thousand years ago, said, uh, if I am not for myself, who will be? If not now, when? Uh, but if I'm only for myself, what am I? It's an extraordinary statement. Jews don't follow the first part. They follow the second part, which uh, is that the most important issue to them, and I understand it, is not their own um, uh, existence and uh, uh, support for that community or the Jewish nation in Israel. It is, what's your position on Medicaid and Medicare and Social Security? And those, those are my positions uh, as well. Uh, and I will not vote for a Republican uh, who uh, wants to destroy uh, those basic uh, rights. I will not uh, vote for no, one. No, by destroy, you don't mean reform, do you? Well, when you say reform, for example, take uh, what uh, uh, the uh, Republican budget uh, wants to do uh, to uh, Medicare. It wants Paul to privatize Ryan. it. He wants to privatize it. Uh, you know, it's a, it's it's a, a gradual privatize. personalization. You get an insurance policy. The government gives you a voucher or a premium, as they uh, like to call it, to buy an insurance policy. And when the insurance goes up, you have to pay the difference, which uh, they've estimated in a few years will be an additional $6,000. I'm just repeating but, what... But back to Jews. I got you off, I got you off track. Oh, okay. And, and the Democratic, capital D Democratic Getting back faith. to the Jews. <laughs> right. So when I went to Florida, I, re, I spoke to three different groups, each about 250 in number in support of Bush. And I could hear people screaming at me. You know, <laughs> he wants us to vote for a Republican. <laughs> I mean, it was... Violation I mean, of a commandment. I mean, it was funny in, mm. uh, in a way. And I look, listen, I'm a very proud Jew, and I love uh, my faith, and I uh, love the people uh, from which I descend and so forth. But uh, I try to say to them, why do you let them take you for granted? You, you had one of the uh, great appearances at the Republican convention in 2004. Right. You said, why am I, Ed Koch, here at a Republican convention? You said, I'm here to convert you. Right. But, but that's for later. You know, let's talk about this. Um, 2008, you know, right-wing Koch fans like me, and there are some, many. Yeah, yeah. Hope you're not embarrassed. No, no. Um, I got the Republican nomination in 1981 in addition to the Democratic nomination. Never been done before. A, a weak year for us. But right. You deserved it. Um, we thought, look, his judgment was Bush over Gore. Beg your pardon. Yeah, his judgment Kerry. was Bush over Kerry. Why isn't his judgment McCain over Obama? Why is Obama more trustworthy in the area of foreign policy? No, I wouldn't say more. No, 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 no. I, I never said more. No, than Kerry. Than Kerry. No, no I'm, with respect to McCain yeah. uh, uh, I and Obama, mm. uh, I said in effect, that Obama was as good as McCain. I didn't say he was better. I never said he was mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, he turned out worse. And I'm not voting for him. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not voting for some crazy Republican who wants to destroy uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. I'm talking about my I just brethren. won't vote yeah. uh, on that line. I'll vote for everything uh, else. Uh, but uh, that's the story. I have no hesitation in crossing party lines, although I don't do it often. Mayor, um, I have so much to discuss with you. Um, let's talk a little Palin. You wrote a column defending her, not so much defending her as saying much of the opposition to her is demonic. It's terrible. It's ridiculous. I, I, I can't think of another public figure. Well, I was going to say, I can't think of another public figure so reviled. I think of bon, Bob Bork, George W. Bush, Ronald Reagan. Everyone's all sweet about him now, and rah, rah, right. Reagan, but right. not at the time, believe me. I, I, but Palin has come in for abuse that I... I've almost never seen. It's outrageous. And um, there are people who are very close to me who take that uh, position. Uh, they say me she's too. Uh, stupid. I said she's not. She may not be knowledgeable. There's no question. Uh, she's made some uh, statements that are just uh, uh, not accurate. 
but she is an intelligent, highly intelligent uh, person, in my judgment. Here is a uh, woman who became governor of uh, Alaska. Uh, I don't agree with her on her positions. Uh, and when she was attacked in a vicious way, I stood up. And she sent me an email. It was very oh, sweet. Really? Yeah, she's thanking me. She said, I know you're going to get into trouble because of this. <laughs> I, I, who cares? No, very nice. I, uh, I told you I'm hopscotching around, and uh, that was a lightish question. This is, I'm, I'm afraid, a very grave one. I don't mind. It's a, it's a terrible question, but it's one I often ask uh, people, knowledgeable people. Um, do you think Israel will make it? Um, you know, uh, the Catholic Church's position is that there is a special bond and relationship uh, that uh, the people of Israel have with God. Now, I happen to believe in God, but I'm a secular Jew. I mean, I, I believe in uh, heaven and hell, punishment uh, and reward. I hope I'll be rewarded. Uh, but I... I cannot believe that a people that have suffered so much uh, over thousands of years will be extinguished. And that is what uh, I uh, hold against uh, Obama, in a way, for not demanding of the uh, Palestinians that they say uh, in advance that if we come up with a settlement and a two-state uh, solution, which I'm for, that we will recognize Israel as a Jewish state. They will not, and they never will. And he should have demanded that as a condition of negotiations. That's one of the major faults in the way he's approached uh, Mideast uh, negotiations, in my uh, judgment. So if you're asking me, uh, do I believe that the Jewish people will survive? Yes, I do. That's a different question from the question of the state of Israel. No, we are so now uh, uh, involved uh, with the resurrection of the state of Israel, which existed you know, several thousand years ago. Um, if uh, Israel were to be destroyed, uh, that would be the destruction of the Jewish people. Uh, that's number one. But I must say to you that what is appalling is the rise of anti-Semitism uh, throughout the world, except I don't see it in the United States. No, I, mean, I don't either. It, it's an extraordinary golden age here. But around the world, I mean, it is huge, huge in Spain, huge in uh, Great Britain, huge in uh, France. Yeah. And it's as though they've forgotten what happened uh, 60 or more uh, years uh, uh, ago. It, it's very dangerous. When I was growing up, the anti-Semitism was always... Well, it was always portrayed as a phenomenon of the right. I don't find that true to life now. Well, I agree with you. Um, I remember in a, uh, when I was a congressman uh, uh, and I went to the Israeli Day Parade in New York City and Rabin uh, was then uh, the ambassador. And uh, Allard Lowenstein was a member of Congress and uh, we were uh, standing there and I could hear a conversation between uh, Allard uh, Lowenstein and Rabin. Uh, Lowenstein was a very able guy, was castigating Rabin. Why did you say those nice things about Nixon? Remember, Nixon did the resupply that saved Israel. Yeah, uh, Golda Meir said so. Yeah, no, there's no question about it. But, but Alad Lowenstein said, Why did you say those nice things about Nixon? And I remember Rabin saying, and it's in one of my books, so uh, you can go look at the exact uh, reference, but uh, saying something along the lines, it's only the conservatives who have ever helped us. It's, mm. it's not the liberals. Mm. And I think that's true. The left is anti-Semitic. I'm not the whole left, yeah. but the radical left, uh, just as the communists were uh, anti-Semitic, uh, just as Stalin was anti-Semitic. It really happened after the 67 war, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. When, the, when the left just plain turned against Israel. Uh, it's terrible, absolutely terrible. Um, you have a bridge. Yeah, I'm not talking right. about dental work. Right. Uh, the Queensboro Bridge is not merely the Queens. Where is the Queensboro Bridge? It, it runs it's from 59th Street hmm. uh, and uh, 2nd Avenue uh, to Long Island City across the East River. It's now the Ed Koch. Queensboro. Koch Queensboro Bridge. Right. 
How's that feel? Well, it felt terrific. I, it was the mayor who uh, came up with the proposal. He called me and said, I'd like to do this. Do uh, you have any objection? I said, no, I have no objection, and I want to thank you. But I thought to myself, it'll never get through the city council. Couldn't you have gone for the Empire State Building or something? No, this was wonderful, because it was my congressional district uh, uh -huh. that uh, was involved. Uh, uh, but anyway, I thought to myself, boy, what will happen in the city council? But I won in the city council by a vote of uh, 38 to 12. Uh, Christine Quinn, who is a speaker, led the fight on my behalf. And to win in the city council on an issue like that, and I won with a majority of the uh, members of the council from uh, Queens, and a majority of uh, the Black and Hispanic Caucus, and a majority of what they call the Progressive Caucus, whatever that is. When, when I was in Congress, I always uh, think about this, you were proud to call yourself a liberal. And those few people who call themselves progressives did so because they thought liberals weren't liberal enough. Yeah, right. Right? Now everybody wants to be a progressive on the left. That's funny about I think that. they're nuts. You can't talk with many people about the issue of their burial, but yeah. we, can, we can talk with you. You've talked about it before. I'm not afraid of death. You don't, um, you said, I don't want to go back to New Jersey. Right, where my you, family has a You plot. said you want to stay in Manhattan. Correct, and on a subway line. Oh, okay. And so you are. And I've written down here um, what will be on this gravestone. First, a I'll have the Star of David. Right. And a, a prayer or a statement. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. That's the holiest prayer in the Jewish religion. But then a statement made by the journalist Daniel Pearl, who right. was beheaded by Al-Qaeda terrorists. A statement I guess he was coerced into making. This was in 2002. My father is Jewish, my mother is Jewish, I am Jewish. I would hope that that would someday be a prayer uttered every day or every Saturday in the synagogue. It is not yet. When, when did the idea come to you that you wanted that inscribed? A couple of years after it Afterward, happened to yeah. him. Uh, and I began to think about uh, my uh, death itself. Americans are terribly afraid of death. I am not. Uh, it's part of life, and uh, that's the way Americans should look at it, and hopefully someday uh, that they will. So I also uh, hope uh, that uh, people will come and visit. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I called up uh, the rabbi of my synagogue, and I told him what I was doing. Oh, was he upset? You know, why don't you come and, and, and be buried? I'll show, let me show you where my mother is buried. Why would I want to be where his mother is buried, mm. which is in Brooklyn or Queens? So uh, I said, no, no, no. And um, uh, I then called uh, a uh, reform rabbi. And I'm, I would consider myself a conservative Jew. There are three, mm. uh, you know, uh, orthodox, reform, and conservative. Um, and I, I would consider myself the, the middle, uh, although I attend an orthodox uh, synagogue because I like the rabbi. Mm. Uh, and uh, I know he can't come to the funeral because uh, he's not allowed to enter a uh, cemetery that isn't Jewish. So I called a reform uh, rabbi and uh, he said, sure, I'll come and officiate. I'm happy to do, uh, do that. And then I read a book and it said, if you're going to be buried, it's non-denominational. It's the Trinity Church, which is the oldest church in America. They have mm -hmm. one down at Wall Street. And yes, the Alexander Hamilton Church. Right, yeah. and it's the only operating cemetery in all of Manhattan. All of the uh, others were closed. No room yeah. at the inn. No yeah. room, right? And the fact is I got one of the last uh, plots and uh, the stone is already up. You know, everything you said is already on the stone hmm. except the date of my death. And uh, I uh, uh, said uh, to the uh, rabbi who gave me the name of a book, I read the book and the book said, if you're gonna be buried in a non-denominational a cemetery, ask them if they would put a, a sign on the gate nearest your uh, plot, gate for the Jews. I thought to myself, I always thought we wanted to go in the regular <laughs> yeah. gate. But if that's what it takes. S separate I'll but equal, why not? <laughs> we're, um, we're just about out of time. I, I want to talk about movies a little. Yeah. Do you have a favorite actor all time? Um, well, not really, but I used to say if they were going to make a uh, movie of me, I'd like um, uh, Paul 
What was his name? I don't remember his name anymore. The one who uh, puts out the uh, lemonade. Paul Newman. Paul Newman. Uh, I, Paul Newman. But then he got too old. <laughs> so. <laughs> and he was short. You're tall and he was short. Right. Yeah. So now uh, uh, Leo... Uh, DiCaprio. DiCaprio. Yeah. Yeah, why not? Why right. not? Right. Yeah, I'll put in a bid for him too. Okay. I recently uh, was on a uh, plane, uh, actually JetBlue, to go to uh, uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, to visit friends, which I do regularly. And uh, I'm sitting in the front row, and I hear a disturbance behind me, and I'm told it's three passengers arguing about uh, baggage. And the captain comes out, and he stands there, and uh, they tell him what's happened. He said, I want him off the plane, bring in the security, throw him off the plane. And then he sees me, and he says, how am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was wonderful. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Do you, you have a patent on that line? No, but yeah. everybody knows it's like, me. Ah, absolutely. Well, how did he do? He did damn well. Thanks a lot, Mayor Koch. Thank you. What a, uh, the man was born to talk, Thank you. Uh, born to think, great spirit in our public life. Thanks a million. And thank you all for watching The Human Parade. That's Ed Koch. I'm Jane Morton. Thank you so much. That was fun. <laughs>